So first of all, thank you to Barbara Lane, who's the Director of Lectures and Literature here at the JCC, for having this program. This is, I don't think that this has happened anywhere before, uh, where we have a whole bunch of citizen science projects in one atrium. And this is it's actually very important. I'll come back to why that's so important. And I'm really grateful to all of you guys who are participating in that. And also love to shout out uh, for, to Maggie Grabmeyer, who, who corralled everybody. And uh, it's always a major task to produce something like this. And she did it with just the most amazingly cheerful attitude the whole time. I was kind of waiting for anything to happen, and it never did. So uh, citizen science is regular people contributing to scientific research. And uh, sometimes this is people who are citizen scientists have been known as amateurs, as, as Barbara said. And that word is from the Latin to love. And it, it is people who have loved nature, who have gone out for hundreds of years and documented nature and collected nature and put it into databases, essentially. These, on the left is a great ox skeleton, and on the right are Carolina parakeets. These are both extinct birds, and these were specimens collected for the California Academy of Sciences. The California Academy of Sciences, like most of our natural history museums, was founded by amateurs. There were no, no, uh, no PhD scientists involved for quite some time. Um, this is the Xerxes blue butterfly. And it is the first invertebrate that we know of that went extinct due to human impacts. And that happened when Golden Gate Park was transformed. It lost a mutualist ant that it had a relationship with. So this is very key that species have relationships with other species. And when you lose one of them, sometimes the other one goes downhill too. Now that ant went locally extinct, not entirely extinct. And that's a bit of a... Um, a fine point, it seems, but it's very relevant. But that that butterfly only lived in Golden Gate Park. And when it lost its ant friend, it went away forever. And it's something about extinction that we have to really you know, absorb, is that when these animals go, they never, ever can come back again. So we don't want to let them go unless it's their time. This is um, the good lord bird, the ivory-billed woodpecker. And it is extinct. This is also a specimen from the California Academy of Sciences. And the ivory-billed woodpecker lost its habitat when the great forests of the East Coast were transformed to create civilization. This is today the biggest driver of extinction is habitat loss. And so we are transforming wild places into agriculture and into buildings and roadways, and we're taking away the home homelands where these creatures live, and then they they have nowhere to live, and they go extinct. So, years ago, four years ago, I published this book, *The Spine of the Continent*, which told a story about the birth of conservation biology. So again, we have another word that has a, a very you know beautiful resonance: con conserv conservation. Conserve is from Latin meaning to save. To, so to actually to save life is, is the name of this branch of biology. On the cover, you see the bottom is this uh, pronghorn antelope on its migration pathway. A lot of what the spine of the continent is about is this large landscape connectivity that is one of the things that animals and plants need to stay healthy and vibrant in their populations. And when that when the connectivity of the natural ecosystem is broken up for them, they, they can go extinct. They get isolated and go extinct. So this was part of that book, was in identifying places where there were endangered linkages, where there was places where plants and animals were in danger of being separated from each other by roadways or by development. And then this, these, all these nonprofits all up and down the the Rockies got together to try to save those particular places and, you know, to, to greater and lesser success. The most successful effort is the path of the pronghorn. So the path of the pronghorn is a single migration of a single antelope herd. And there used to be thousands of these historical migrations across the entire United States. Um, Alan Fish, who was out in the atrium today who runs the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory was telling me, like me, he likes to go read old expedition diaries. <laughs> and he was reading the expedition diary of Father 
Crespi, who came with Portola in 1769 and made, quote unquote, first contact with the native Californians. But Crespi, he documented antelope. These pronghorn antelope lived in California, 1769. They lived all over the lower 48. Now there's only, there's still plenty of pronghorn antelopes. Well, I don't know if there's plenty, but they're not all endangered. But this particular herd was in danger because of fracking, because fracking was invented in the Jonah infield drilling fields in Wyoming, and all of these heavy trucks come in, all these new roadways, and nobody knew that they were actually bifurcating this migration pathway. Now, pronghorn antelope are OCD. They will only go one way. <laughs> they, you don't, like, they don't go around a truck. They're like, they want, their pathway is one mile wide, that's it. And if they can't keep going, they basically stop. And they get hit by cars and trucks and trains all the time because of that. So what happened, though, is scientists got together with activists and local people to document exactly where was this migration pathway. Now, this was not called citizen science when this happened, but it would be called citizen science today. And it would have happened faster because we could have used smartphone technology to document when and where the, the antelope were. These photographs that I'm showing you were taken by Joe Riss, who's an incredible wildlife photographer, and it took him two years to get basically the eight photographs that I showed you. And he put up cameras where he felt that he thought that the antelope were going to be coming through based on all sorts of research. And then he verified it when he actually got these great photographs of antelope actually using this migration pathway. So once that map pathway was defined, it could be protected. And this goes to the heart of what we need citizen science to do today, is to identify where are the animals and plants and where are they using the landscape so that we can protect the way that they're moving across it. And scientists just don't have this information across all of these, these huge spaces across the United States. So how does life work? Life works by the interactions of creatures on the earth. Uh, the sun creates photosynthesis with plants, which becomes the basis of the food chain. And then there are herbivores that eat the, the, the greenery. And then top predators like this mountain lion eat the, the herbivores. And we are the very top predators. We don't eat mountain lions, but we eat the herbivores a lot. And we also eat the plants a lot. So not only are, is all of life feeding on itself, but it's also creating a, the environment that we live in, clean air, clean water, and the temperature that we like to live in. This is a beaver. The beaver creates all sorts of habitat the way that they live on the waterways. And when beavers are allowed to live on waterways, they bring in all sorts of other creatures, and it's a much more vibrant ecosystem. So again, it's this way of creating more habitat and creating more life. And there's a relationship between the top carnivore in this illustration of the wolf with, you can see between the wolf's legs is an, is an elk and, um, and then the beaver in the bottom and they all go together. So what's happened here in the United States and in my book I talk a lot about the state of California which I focus on partly because one thing about being a citizen scientist is being place-based. Understand where you live, uh, who lives there with you, and, uh, and learn about it, and get into it. It's really fascinating, and we are really super lucky because we live in a really fascinating place. Between our geography, our climate, uh, the kinds of animals and plants that are here, we live in the, what's called the California Floristic Province. It's one of the world's hot spots of biodiversity. For many, many centuries, it was thought that California was an island. Um, and in a way, it is an island because it's separated by mountain ranges from other territory, other land, and that's created very special species. So when white people came to the coast, uh, they started to do things like take the whales out of the ecosystem. The whaling industry came west, and almost all these huge, big-bodied animals were depleted out of, out of the waters. Grizzly bears were summarily shot and killed because the, when the Spanish came, they established cattle grazing as a way to, to establish farming and their own kinds of, of, of economies. And grizzly bears and wolves, which they also killed and took out of the ecosystem, were predating on the, the livestock. Then, this is a picture of, from the gold rush of taking down the redwood trees. 
And then another one is the sea otters. The sea otters were completely taken out of the ecosystem and, and were extinct essentially in the waters here until the early part of the century. Now the numbers have come back up. So the sea otters suffer the same fate as beavers and they were, they were killed for their fur. And there was just a massive trade, a massive uh, demand for otter fur by the Chinese Mandarin class, which made just beautiful capes out of this incredible fur. So the, the otter tells a story of what happens when you start to take certain animals out of the ecosystem. In the water, the sea otter is a top predator, looks cute, but still top predator. So the sea, the sea otters have no fat. They keep warm by this incredible fur coat that they have and by eating constantly. They just eat all day long, and they, they eat a lot of sea urchins. So they take the sea urchins, and they, they put a rock on their chest, and they smash the sea urchins on the rock. They open the sea urchin, and they eat it, and they do it all day long. When you take the sea urchins out of the water, I mean, the, the sea otters out, the sea urchins are not being predated on, and their, their populations boom, and they eat kelp. So then the sea urchins start eating all the kelp. And kelps are like the forest of the water, uh, especially on the Pacific coast. Huge habitat for all sorts of other creatures. So then there's no kelp and everything else goes away. And this is happening right now in parts of along the coast. And it's a, something you can do very easily with, for citizen science is participating in something called floating forests. And you can go on your computer and there's a great big platform called Zooniverse. It's one of the totally digitally based citizen science projects. And the human eye can detect kelp forests better than computers can, as human eyes can detect galaxies better than computers can. So what they have people doing is identifying in pictures where they see kelp forests. And then they're helping to sort of zero in on where to increase, you know, kind of guard in the ocean and bring that kelp back. Um, there's sea urchin populations that are now, they are collapsing on the, the California coast because they've depleted their own food system. And this is how one extinction, taking out the one sea otter, leads to other extinctions. And this is happening just everywhere. So this is a, an illustration that a, an artist named Lily Klee made for a, a book called The Tipping Point, How Close Are We, How Close Is Planet Earth to the Edge? Something, I'm not getting that subtitle correctly. But um, this book is about how we've reached a point where taking out all of these animals is putting such pressure on, on Earth processes that we're, we're in danger of reaching tipping points, and we already have reached tipping points. Here in California, we have reached a tipping point with our forests. So we have 66 million dead trees uh, in California, and they're never coming back again. Basically, you know, there's the natural drought, but it's exacerbated by climate change. It's exacerbated what's happened to the trees by the fact that native Californians, they tended the forests in a different way than we do. They used low, low controlled burning to keep, to keep some of the forest clear. And um, that has been curtailed for several hundred years, which has had disastrous results. So when those, those forests are either going to go up in flames or they're going to die and they, they are dead or they're just going to decompose with beetles, but they, they're likely to not come back again. California is likely to look different in 150 years than it looks today because there's not enough water in the system to sustain growth of a new forest. So these are, these are you know, it's happening all over the place. We think about extinction as uh, something that is happening on these large landscapes like in Africa or in the Arctic, and that's the case that's happening. Um, but it's also happening in our own backyards. This is a, a photograph by Fritz Lanting, who's a great uh, nature photographer. And this is um, just a cover of the magazine. Um, this was a State of the Birds report, 314 bird species on the brink, and half of all birds at risk of extinction. So, and if you think about birds, right, they fly and a lot of them migrate up and down the coast and all around the world. They're kind of creating this, this huge tapestry of kind of a warp and weft of nutrients that they're bringing from one place to another. And um, they, they're interacting with the ecosystems in all sorts of different ways. But they're having a really hard time 
um, doing that because their habitat is lost in so many places. So one really wonderful citizen science project that I always like to call out is called Bird Returns. And this is something that the Nature Conservancy and Point Blue Conservation Science and um, eBird, of, which is part of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, all got their heads together to do. And what they're doing, the Nature Conservancy, you know, is a land trust, and they usually buy up habitat and protect it. It's very, very expensive. And as, ha as climate change is occurring, it's harder and harder to know what is the best pieces of land to protect, because plants and animals are moving their ranges as they need to find different temperatures to live in. So they had this brilliant idea to have a reverse auction with rice farmers in the Central Coast. So birds that migrate over California and were on the Pacific Flyway, so it's a very important migration pathway. It's one of the most significant ones in the world. 93% of wetlands that birds used as habitat to rest and feed up on their migration is gone. 93% gone. So that's, you know, that's reductions of numbers of birds when that's, you know, where we get that half of them gone. That's why. Because there's not enough habitat to support them. So what they decided to do is to ask rice farmers to keep their, far, their fields flooded for a few more weeks in the winter when the birds are coming through. But how could they tell when the birds were coming through and where they were going to be from citizen science collected data? So this is my day leader, Christine Carino, on the hawk watch. And right now, this a hawk migration going on across the Golden Gate, going across the bridge, but it's been doing it long before there was a bridge. And we are taking note of how many birds and what species we see. So I, every two weeks, I go out from 9.30 to 3.30, basically, and stand in one of the four cardinal directions and count birds and identify hawks. So Rachel Carson, everybody knows who Rachel Carson is, right? Rachel Carson famously, she stopped DDT she, from being used widely as a pesticide by noticing that there was this huge mortality in hawks. And how did she understand that? But she understood that by looking at data collected at Hawk Mountain on the East Coast, collected by citizen scientists. So she looked at all that data, year after year, the hawk numbers going down, 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 and she correlated it with DDT use. And that's what, that's what makes citizen science science, basically, is using big, what we would do on a computer today. She probably didn't do it on a computer when she did it, but you, you take a big look at this big haystack of what's going on out there, and then you're looking for patterns. You don't want to look for a needle because you don't want to have an idea of what you're looking for first. You want to see the pattern that's there. So that's kind of the essence of citizen science. And today we have that capacity to observe and take note of where nature is right in our smartphones. So this is a slide that is showing iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is this incredible um, web-based program and app. Uh, it's housed at the California Academy of Sciences. And with iNaturalist, you can take an observation of something like that snake. And using this app, it identifies a date, a time, a latitude, and a longitude with that photograph. And then it goes up on like a Facebook feed. like so. And people around the world are looking at it, including a lot of experts, scientists, who are verifying the ID. So I don't know what species of snake that is. But it would take th when three scientists concur, yes, that is that kind of a snake, that data, that piece of data goes up into a database that's in use all over the world by scientists to, to be discerning these patterns. But citizen science, um, the, this, these are uh, finch specimens from the California Academy of Sciences. Darwin went to the Galapagos and he had his idea that evolution happens by way of natural selection by looking at different beaks and different physiologies of different birds on different islands. He actually had his idea about mocking thrushes, as he called them. But later, it was through the finches that there's different set species on each of the islands that um, really led to quantifying Darwin's idea. But it wasn't until many years later that that happened. So th this is one way of showing or saying that when you take observations, now we're not going to be killing finches the way they did then. Now we're going to be taking their picture with iNaturalist instead. And if Darwin had had iNaturalist on aboard the Beagle, he would have come up with his, his, um, his 
his theory a lot faster. So what do we do with that data? Here is this wonderful visualization of a single warbler migration across the lower 48. Now, what you, that light that is showing you the population and numbers and density of birds as they travel across the, the lower 48 in a year, this is all citizen science collected data. So eBird, which is a database for bird observations, is really the, the mothership of citizen science and has more than 200 million bird observations. So when you, you have that many observations, you can create patterns like this. And it, it, they're so beautiful. If you go on the website of Cornell Lab of Ornithology, they have about 12 different visualizations like this. So we need that kind of data for all sorts of other taxa. And we can help extinction and get, get some of these larger bodied creatures that we still have. We can protect them. The Save the Redwoods League is, is a fantastic organization that is a land trust, has hardcore scientists that do like mind boggling analysis, and then two really fantastic citizen science projects. One is Redwood Watch and one is Fern Watch. So with Redwood Watch, we're, Redwoods are losing their range as the climate is changing because it's getting hotter. Uh, but they're hardy trees and they grow in a lot of other places besides their natural historical range. So Save the Redwoods League is asking people to go out and let's find out where those redwoods are growing so they can kind of better ground truth where, again, to make their big investments in protecting the landscape. This is uh, one of, a finch nest from the Galapagos. And this goes to the heart of, I think, the intersection of, of some dimensions of citizen science. So again, we go back to Darwin. Each of those finches living on a different island, eating different food, and having different vegetation with which to make their nests. So they have beautiful nests at the academy in the specimen collections. And each one of them from the different islands is different because different vegetation grow on each island. And the word nest is from the French niche, which means to belong, essentially. And that your niche in the world describes not only where you like to live, but who you eat and who eats you. And um, this is really a sense of belonging that also extends to us as people in the sense of citizen science as a place-based pursuit to really understand where do we live, what are the what are the the fundamental attributes of where we live and how do we want to help protect those attributes to also protect the species in them. So here's a photograph of Mount Tam and one of the citizen science projects that I've been part of is an academy project to help the Marin Municipal Water District document all of the vegetation types on Mount Tam. And part of what they're doing, this is the, so three years we went out and documented all of the plants. And now we're, we're uh, looking at wildlife picture index, pictures of species moving through the landscape and identifying them. But part of what we're doing is ground truthing the work. It's not ground truthing the work, updating the work, re-monitoring the mountain. This is Alice Eastwood, and she's a, a character in my book. I profile a bunch of historical citizen scientists. She's one of them, just like an incredible woman. Um, as somebody said tonight, she was a badass, and she was. She was a happy woman. Look at that face. Her whole life, she lived a long life. She worked as a, as a curator of botany at the Academy for more than 50 years, and she beamed in every photograph along that long life. And she documented Mount Tam in a very comprehensive way. So today, when we document Mount Tam, we can look at her specimens, and we can look at our specimens, and then we can see patterns of change. And uh, right now, people are working at Mount Tam to figure out what have we lost since, since she had did her, her inventory. What have we lost? What could we bring back? What should we bring back? Or what might be remnant species? And I feel like this is a great thing that citizen science does um, because we can restore. When we restore habitat, when we protect it and support it, species come back. You think of Mount Tam as completely protected, but it's actually not. Um, wonderful things happening there. This organization, it's an umbrella effort called One Tam is going on now. And there'll be a science symposium in the end of 
October in Marin about all the science that is known about Mount Tam, which would, will be really cool. And the Parks Conservancy is really driving, driving that. Um, but Mount Tam goes to the heart of something that I think, you know, we, we think of, we're lucky, we live in the Bay Area, we have all this beautiful space, it's been protected, it's done. But it's actually not done at all. And we need to be paying attention, we need to revitalize our stewardship and understand that we need to be active participants in protecting these landscapes and supporting them. So for example, in Mount Tam, you know, they, they have a terrible French broom problem. It's an invasive species and it takes over other, other plants, it outcompetes natives, and it's a fire starter. So it's a very nerve wracking one because when it goes up in, in, in flames, it has a big conflagration and Mount Tam we know is surrounded by human buildings which we don't want to have that happen to. So going and actually pulling French broom or helping with trails, this, I, my definition of a citizen scientist, that's not really science, but since you're helping to, to support a natural ecosystem, I, I give you the, the credit of being a citizen science if you, scientist if you do that. And here's um, a slide from Slide Ranch out in, in the Tamalpais region, you know, where kids are coming out there of all, from all over the Bay Area to learn about nature and sustainable agriculture and doing all kinds of place-based understanding. Here is a slide, the Green Hair Street Corridor. This is from San Francisco. So some, the, these are projects that are out there when you, after we talk, you can go and check them out again. This is a fantastic project where the species that this rare butterfly, the green hair streak, likes or is adapted to live with is being planted in places where the green hair streak butterfly used to tarry. And when you plant it, they will come and they come, they're coming. So it's a wonderful project and a very appropriate one for kids as well as adults. Here's a bee a native bee. The Great Sunflower Project, which is out there, is the biggest pollinator um, citizen science project in the world, I think. And as we're having these bee colony collapses, we need to know where the bees are doing okay, where the native bees are, and this project anybody can do with this pack of sunflower seeds, I think, that they've got out there. Um, the Sea Star with the California Academy of Sciences, I've been um, monitoring Pillar Point, Tide pool is a really amazing project. Um, the, the monitoring plots that were chosen for us to go out and, and count up species in periodically were chosen because they had these vibe, such a big amount of species of sea stars in them. So this is a, a sea star, AKA starfish. You're allowed to still call it a starfish because a lot of scientists do, but they're animals, they're not fish. They're echinoderms, they're pretty crazy. And um, within, within three months of starting to monitor plots that had 70 different sea stars in them, there were none. And we're witnessing this die-off of sea stars. It's the biggest marine die-off known to man in the coast, on the coast. It's a wasting disease. Uh, on the bottom right, you can see the wasting. I'm not sure if the sea stars in the middle frame are healthy or not. But with iNaturalist, um, observations, all sorts of people all up and down the coast can make observations about what they find in the tide pools at different uh, monitoring moments. And we can get a picture of, of where it's happening and when. Now it's a case of, you know, they know it's a virus that's killing the sea star, don't really know why it got instigated to suddenly kill them. We know from citizen science collected data actually that the virus was in the water for 20 years at least. So why it suddenly killed them, nobody knows. Um, massive sea, sea bird die off in the last year and a half. I think Beach Watch was out there tonight as well. And this is partly caused by the drought and the drought is exacerbated by climate change. So, you know, we, I always, I feel like I bum people out a lot because there's really a lot of bad things to tell you. <laughs> but, but I think the worst thing is to not be involved with it in what, and, you know, there's so many different ways to be involved with citizen science, and you don't even have to be involved in citizen science. Just put nature in your head and do something for nature in some way. And if all you want to do is write a check to an organization, that's good too. 
but there's so many other ways to to be involved. And I know for myself, um, I've been a citizen scientist really for five years because I did some citizen science projects as part of the spine of the continent. And um, I, you know, you just fall in love with nature and it will never exhaust your curiosity. There's always more discovery. And you start to see your own patterns, you know, patterns that you come up with. And then quite often there's a scientist around and you can ask them about it. And I find it, um, I find it very re rewarding. But I, I want to say one more thing and then I'll open up to questions with Barbara. Tonight we have all of these citizen science projects in one place and we have all of you in one place. And this is the kind of thing that I, you know, at the end of every book, I've got another problem, right? The end of the spine of the continent, the problem was nature is under assault. What could possibly scale to address it? The answer, citizen science. Now I've written this book about citizen science. What does citizen science need? Citizen science needs to get outside of its little one-off programs and be networked together. And we need to cross-pollinate with other people, not just the naturalists, although God bless the naturalists and thank you for doing that. But, you know, I mean, I wish uh, yoga studios would have citizen science. How can we, how can we get our bodies in, in alignment and then walk out into a world which is so completely out of alignment? Um, and how I want church groups who love, you know, profess to support life to do citizen science, to actually contribute to, to sustaining life in a very, you know, profound and simple way. So I just am very, very pleased about this event, and I would like to see more events like this in the future, and let's grow our tribe of people who care, and we'll do something about it. So thank you. Oh. Hi, I know a lot of you have questions or comments and are involved because you're here tonight. So please just put up your hand and we will get to you. And we're going to start with you right over here. I have a question. I got here tonight in a car that I use fossil fuel. You know, wearing shoes that probably have plastic in them. I have, I wash my hair with shampoo from a plastic bottle. I'm wearing something that was shipped to me. How much am I contributing to all this? And what can, what, where? I mean. Well, thank you. It's a beautiful question because, I mean, I, I struggle with it every single day myself. You know, the way that we do things is, is, um, is on every level part of the problem. And, you know, we can't just stop living, you know. <laughs> we can't just, like, put on a, a wolf suit and go live in a cave. It's just <laughs> not going to really work for us, right? So I think this is where, again, citizen science is an answer for me, because by actually engaging and committing to doing something, it opens up especially a connection with other people and other dimensions of what's going on. There's, there's place for, so if we become aware, like we do not want to have fossil fuels anymore, right? So that's something to be an activist in. You know, it's important to not spread yourself too thin on the activism. So I think it's good to focus on one thing and, and go all the way with it. But if we have, this is where f building a community is important because when we have collective um, pressure on systems of manufacture, they change. We, we, change has happened. Rachel Carson got DDT off the market. That can be done again. I have a question, Mary Ellen. I have a million questions, but I'm going to let you guys have some sea otters. So you talked about how the sea otters were going away, and I'm hoping that they're coming back again, and I want to hear the rest of that story and what's being done to bring them back. So sea otters have recovered a lot. Uh, they are not back in historic numbers, but they are. They started to be noticed to come back a long time ago in like the 30s. And over these years, they have steadily come back. And there's, there's some very focused groups supporting sea otters. As they've come back, they've helped to heal the functioning of the water where they live. So it's all showing, this is works, this is great. If you allow them to come back, they will. I'll say one thing though, both um, sea otters and elephant seals. Elephant seals were also, how many people have seen the elephant seals at Anya Nueva? So 
they are so genetically similar that they cannot be told apart by looking at their DNA. In fact, the scientists who study them tell them apart by the vocalizations they make because they have individual vocalizations. So what happened is they were hunted as the whales were for their blubber to make oil. They were almost, we thought they were extinct. They started to come back, but they're all coming back from a very, very reduced population. And the same thing is with the sea otters. So, you know, nature really is very resilient and these animals will come back, but it's like we're not out of the woods with either the sea otters or the, the elephant seals because those populations are more susceptible to a single disease or a single wipeout because they do not have genetic diversity in them. But it's still positive stories of coming back. Okay, um, hands up if you have questions. Maggie's there with the microphone. She's going to come to you. The next and question is right back here. Hey, Mary Ellen. Hey, Keith. <laughs> it's Kenichi. Um, <laughs> so maybe this is too much of an insider question, but citizen scientist is kind of a loaded and problematic term. I think a lot of quote unquote professional scientists don't think citizen scientists are real scientists. And I think a lot of people who you might describe as a citizen scientist don't think of themselves as real scientists. So is there a way to get away from that phrase? Is there another way to describe this practice in these people? Or is, is, is the act of describing it as an identity versus a practice the problem in itself? Well, thanks, Kenichi, for asking that question. I mean, this, this is something that's under discussion constantly in certain circles. Um, and it has actually even more dimensions than what Kenichi just articulated. Sometimes scientists don't think of citizen scientists as doing real science. Sometimes a citizen scientist doesn't want to feel like they have the burden of being a professional scientist. Uh, there's also an objection to the term citizen, because it would seem to exclude people who don't have citizenship in the United States. To, well, there's a big discussion of that. So there's, of course, being academics who are discussing it, their proposed term is public participata participation in scientific research, or PPSR. <laughs> Do you want to be a PPSR? No. I, I decided that I was going to, like, I did address this issue a little bit in the, in the narrative. But I didn't go down the whole pathway of it because I, I actually feel like it's more of an insider baseball problem than it is a big problem. Um, you know, I've been challenged, well, what's the difference between a naturalist and a citizen scientist? And I'm like, nothing. You know, I think if you are pulling out invasive weeds, you're a citizen scientist. It's, another, it's sort of a refresher name for a naturalist. And if you don't like it, you don't have to use it. I mean, I don't care. That's fine. I just want you to do this, do the work and get outside. There's a question back here, Mary Ellen, to your left over here. Stand up, please. Oh, sure. Oh, stand up. Thanks. Hi, Mary Ellen. Hi, Dan. Uh, <laughs> sort of the opposite question, perhaps, when you were getting at sort of how do we get the widest possible participation, and to what extent do you um, make participation as easy as possible, even at the expense of data you might want, so that it's really, really easy for people in a random yoga studio to participate? Well, I think that's really to the heart of the problem. To, to a heart, to, that one concerns me more. Um, and I do try to remember to tell people, I do want you to just go out and do this, but don't just do it your own way. Use one of these um, tools, like iNaturalist, or Nature's Notebook, or eBird, there's a whole panoply of tools that have been scientifically vetted where there's a database where the protocols for contributing to that database have been very carefully discerned. Um, because what we do want is for our individual efforts to aggregate to a collective impact and to make a collective pattern. And if you uh, observed bees in your backyard every 20 minutes and your next door neighbor observed them every 30 minutes, guess what? You have two different databases that can't go together at, at all. So they're both useless. So you want to do it Gretchen Laboon's way with the Great Sunflower Project. You want to follow her instructions and put it in her database. But given that, you have tremendous flexibility about how to put together the community of people to do it. So it's, it is very important that when you're collecting data that you use something that is already invented. There's way enough things already invented. And so you can find those on something called SciStarter.org. And if you forget these things and you want to email me, my website has a contact form and I'll remind you of how to find it. 
Um, SciStarter.org has a lot. You can punch in what you're looking for, and a, and a whole list of citizen science projects will come up. I have actually personally had better luck finding citizen science projects when I'm looking for them by just typing in, like, state of Georgia citizen science, and I've gotten way more. So it's, you can find this kind of stuff pretty easily. The next question is right back here. She had. Okay, here. She already asked it. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, it's good this uh, works locally, but it also needs to work globally. And uh, some of the ways that to make things more exposed globally is to share data, put data that's collected up in a way that everybody can get to, and then citizen science data hackers can put their views on it and and it can grow out of that so how much is the back end together because the front end's working pretty well here but how, how much uh, how much is in the back end that makes it really shareable well this is a great question that's that's really terrific um thank you for asking it so it, the back end is totally together so on iNaturalist when you put in your data um, the back end of iNaturalist is, is, is a honed <laughs> process and machine. And when there's a protocol for accepting that piece of data in order to put it into the, to the big global database, which is called GBIF, and, but there's a process and that's, that's where it's headed. And GBIF is in use by scientists all over the world 24-7. And you can uh, query, query the data yourself if you want. On Nature's Notebook, there's a, a just a tab, you can, you can do your own statistical analysis using their data. That's from the National Phenology Network. This has, you know, goes all the way back to Jefferson and phenology records in the United States that go back a couple hundred years. So this, this is why you do want to use something like iNaturalist, National Nature's Notebook, because the back end is solid. I have another sort of specific question. You gave us some very upsetting information tonight about trees, especially trees around here. So make me feel better. What's going on? <laughs> well, I'm you sorry. know, I, I frankly, the tree thing, I feel like we are in this moment of time where somehow we're not noticing that what's happening right around us. And this ha is happening. You know, if you can go online tonight, actually, and you can type in wildfires in California, you'll see a map of wildfires right now raging in the central state, center of the state. And it's not necessarily bad that fire happens, but it's, it's exacerbated by global warming and climate change. And the thing is, our world is changing because of it. The biotic response is occurring. And that's, it's, it's urgent. To, to do something. We're not going to stop, we're not going to bring back the forests of California, but we can do a lot to protect other species that are still doing okay. And, and some forests will be fine. We need to protect what we still have. I mean, if we protect Mount Tam, that will be doing a lot, right? That's what we can do locally. And if we can re restore the habitat connectivity in the Bay Area. Also, the... Um, I'm just making a free association so I don't forget. But the I think it's November 7th, is that right, Rebecca? The the 6th, November 6th, BioBlitz. This is a BioBlitz of the Laurel Hill area to with a, a pointed scientific question, which is, can we find the species that used to live here, especially Manzanita, which Alice Eastwood, remember her, she was a Manzanita expert. And now there's hopeful stories because the, we thought this one spec, uh, species of manzanita was completely extinct because of ch changing San Francisco into a city. And when Doyle Drive was, was being constructed, this is, I think, a hilarious story. This, this botanist, the head of the California Native Plant Society, Dan Glusenkamp, was driving by. And he, uh, he, he looked out the car window and he's like, I think that's a is a San Francisco manzanita, and I thought it was extinct, and it, it wasn't. He, he found it because it was exposed now by that construction. So there's, there's life to be uncovered. It's not only death that we're discovering, but until we really get into it and uncover the life that's still there and, and understand what we need to do to prevent death that is unwarranted, you know, this, we're gonna see conversions of the places that we love in ways that we do not like. 
Oh, we have a couple more questions, and then we're going to give you all an opportunity to talk with the experts who are assembled here tonight, as well as pick up a fabulous book. So you mentioned uh, protecting forests. And when I was a little kid and a Cub Scout, Boy Scout, protecting forests meant not letting them burn. Now it turns out, well, maybe that's not such a good idea. Uh, maybe they should burn occasionally. So uh, as citizens, if we want to get, how do we protect forests? Forests and fires, this is a huge issue and question and frankly an area where there are really a lot of different expert opinions. In general, there is a consensus understanding that fire needs to be on the landscape in California, that the, the ecosystem here co-evolved with fire, and that suppressing it on the landscape, thank you, Smokey Bear, um, has been disastrous for the ecosystem. Now, you'll still get some scientists that say, we don't want them to burn too hot because that's too destructive, and you'll have other scientists say, even the hottest ones cause regeneration of the forest. But then when I say to that scientist, well, what about the fact that there's not enough water in the system to regenerate forest? That scientist said, oh, I didn't think of that. I mean, they go down these paths, right? And this is actually a role for the citizen, is to ask these questions. Joseph Campbell, who if you're old enough, you'll remember as the person who, who uh, he did the Hero of a Thousand Faces. He said, the journalist, the job of the journalist is to educate yourself in public. Well, I would say that the job of the citizen scientist is like the job of the journalist. Ask questions and educate yourself in public. Because sometimes scientists, it's not their fault because they have, they all work incredibly hard. They're like the hardest working people. But they go down these narrow research pathways and they don't often see the bigger question or they don't talk to each other. Actually, this one TAM science conference is going to be fascinating because one thing that the uh, Parks Conservancy did is they collected all of the scientists in the Bay Area that have science collected about Mount TAM. They, they have science that they had never shared with each other, ever. And now they're consolidated it all into a big white paper. So this is also, thank you, you know, philanthropy and thank you, activist organizations. They're the ones making the better science happen. That's the huge role of the citizenry, right? Make the better science happen and support the scientists. The next question is right back here. Hi, Mary Ellen. How are you? Hi, David. Um, so I'm I think wondering I know whether... everybody in this room. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. This... We're a tribe. That's right. I'm wondering whether scientists who work for state and federal agencies are using citizen scientists or resisting citizen scientists. Um, geological, geological survey, you know, park service, state park services, things like that. Well, a lot of them are using citizen science. And in fact, the federal government in April declared citizen, National Citizen Science Day. And John Holdren, who is the science advisor to the president of the United States, directed to the federal agencies that all of them now should use citizen science as part of what they do. So when I last looked, there were about 80 citizen science projects undertaken by federal agencies. There's probably twice that many now. Um, and it is seen not only as a way to involve people more directly, the passive American public, but also a way to increase democracy, to increase democratic transactions. You have a place like Flint, Michigan, where the water is having lead leached into it. If those people had had citizen science protocols for monitoring their water for the last 20 years, they would have had the power of information in their own hands to, uh, to circumvent the, the, what they've had to face now. And actually, the federal government wants people to have the power, actually. So it's really, it's very positive. Last question back here. Stand up. Hi, Mary Ellen. Hi, Amy. <laughs> um, back to that question, I'm sure you can guess what I'm asking about. Fundraising and money for all of these projects. Can you talk a little bit about who might actually fund them? Well, or be interested in funding them? You know, I, I want big funders to come to me and say, we want to fund citizen science, what should we do? And I want to tell them, here are the people that you need to get in a room, and I have that list ready to go. And, and they, those are the people who need to, dis, to really hammer out what the network is going to be. I think the answer is we need to network um, citizen science projects. I also don't think that it has to be that expensive. 
because citizen science kind of can happen on a shoestring. And but what we do need is like a website, a place to aggregate data, and a, a place to visualize it, so that I can go home and go, or on my smartphone from the hawk watch, and I can say, well, I saw six sharp-shinned hawks today, but what did any whale watcher see? What did a beach watch person see? And I want to see what all of this is happening in the Bay Area, and also to connect with other citizen scientists like myself, but who might be monitoring something else. Um, so that's what I want to have happen. Uh, if you want to give money to the California Academy of Sciences, I want you to put citizen science in the <laughs> in the um, the part of your check, so that that's what you're funding and not something else there. Although they're doing many other worthy things. Um, and you know, when I was researching the spine of the continent, I read a really fascinating book that had really delineated how actually the smallest nonprofits, the smallest, most local nonprofits. Um, have the most impact, and that your five dollars that goes to a small group is going to be purposed more fully um, than your big check that goes to a big institution. Now, I don't want to say don't give to big institutions. Well, one other group I want to call out um, as something that I think is an, a good step forward, maybe a first step for a, a, some of you, is the California Naturalist Program. So this this organization really excites me because it is a network of California naturalists all up and down the state. So to your point that we need you know, global, we need bigger reach, it's not just local, we also need regional. And the California Naturalist Program is a regional network of people. So you, what you do is you take a class, and it's usually a 10 week class in a place like Jepson Herbaria has one over in Berkeley. Um, and they're all over the state. Uh, there's, there's been some at the College of Marin. You have to kind of look on the website to find where they're being offered. And you learn everything about California natural history. And it's, it's just a fantastic course. I did the one-week immersion course in Yosemite. I would highly recommend that. <laughs> it was really fun. And also, I did it with like 20 other people, and we're all still in touch with each other. And this, to me, is part of really part of the deal, is that then we're in touch with each other. So we're in our, we're, we're building a network. And the, so the California Naturalist Program has already got this network, and it would be good to join it if you are interested in that. So I want to thank you all for coming tonight and for being part of such an important process. Um, please stay, talk to each other, learn, buy books. Mary Ellen Hannibal, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank You're doing you such a wonderful that. thing. Good night. <laughs>